Good evening, everyone. I'm Debbie Hilbesell, and tonight we're going to be doing case list review, and it is Tuesday, November 8th. And I don't know if any of you saw the lunar eclipse early this morning, but I was up and I saw it, so it was pretty cool. All right, so that's just your fun little something to take your mind off this upcoming test. All right, so let's talk about how we're gonna to participate today. All right, most of you I'm sure know how to do this, but I'm gonna run through it. So there's the little orange arrow up in your upper right hand um, part of your computer screen that will open and close your panel. It looks like maybe a few people might not be just using their mic and speakers, but for those that are using their mic and speakers for your audio and to speak, there's not a darn thing you need to do. And then with regards to if you are using a telephone, you'll get a um, phone number access code and a pin. Most important thing, of course, is how to volunteer to, um, for uh, to do our case list review tonight. And we'll, we'll, I'll wait up for a few more minutes because I want to go over my little pearls in the beginning. And then what I'll do is I will ask for volunteers. And of course, what I'll ask for first are for those who have not gone yet in October. And I've got a list of everybody who's already participated. And we'll see if we can get any of those candidates who haven't been on the hot seat yet to see if they'd like to go on the hot seat. The other thing I'd like you to think about is when I call on you, um, as a volunteer, if you really have a specific case you'd like to look over or you'd like to be tested on, or you have you would prefer a certain case list, please let me know. All right, so now, oh, the other thing too is just make sure when I call on you, make sure the little or underneath the orange arrow where the microphone is, there's that little green, there's a little circle, just make sure that you are um, unmuted on your end. All right, so I wanna just take about mm, maybe five minutes to go over this. Um, osteoporosis is one of the things where a lot of you guys don't really treat much of it at all and even still get kind of confused of when you use a FRAC score, et cetera. But this comes from the clinical practice guidelines. Remember, those are the replacement of the practice bulletins. Are There are clinical practice guidelines. And this is just from April of this year. So I just pulled out some pearls that I thought we could go over. Oftentimes I'll ask the candidates when I'm testing on an office case. So um, before starting patient on pharmacotherapy for osteoporosis, tell me what labs you're gonna get and why. And a lot of the candidates can't answer that or they'll fumble through it a little bit. So this is right from the guidelines. Before you're gonna start anyone on a bisphosphonate or den denosumab, you're gonna get a CBC, you're going to get a metabolic profile. What are you really looking for there? You're looking for abnormalities in calcium. You're looking for abnormalities in the renal function. You're also looking at phosphorus and magnesium levels because both of those are integrally, integral, integrally, can, I can't even speak. I've been so busy doing mock orals today. I think my tongue is tied. But anyway, so phosphorus and magnesium are also important components of bone health and are involved in bone metabolism. So all of those need to be normal. You're gonna do a 24 hour urine collection, and I should have written urine collection, sorry, it just said 24 hour collection, for calcium, sodium, and creatinine excretion. So the most important thing is with regards to uh, calcium, some people, as they get older, they actually get a renal calcium leak, and they just excrete a lot of calcium in their urine, and that does increase the risk of um, osteoporosis. You're gonna check liver function test, you're gonna get a TSH with or without a free T4, and you're gonna get a 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. So that's the minimum workup you should do before you start someone on pharmacotherapy. And the main thing you're doing is you're ruling out other causes of uh, bone loss more than just being postmenopausal and female. 
after you've evaluated uh, for possible remediable secondary causes like a low vitamin D or hyperthyroidism, then you, pharmacotherapy is recommended for postmenopausal osteoporosis in any of these patients. If you've got a T-score of minus 2.5 or worse, that's osteoporosis, right? You should be on pharmacotherapy. If you've had a history of a fragility fracture. And you should think of that if you go from standing to falling in your break. Like if I tripped and caught myself with my wrist and I had a Collie's fracture of the wrist, that's a fragility fracture. I shouldn't have just broken from going from standing to falling. Or if patients have um, vertebral fractures, even if they're asymptomatic, that you get an X-ray for some reason, and the radiologist makes a comment that there are vertebral fractures. That tells you you have poor bone quality. That in itself is an indication for pharmacotherapy. And then, of course, if you have that low bone mass or, quote, what we used to call osteopenia, so if you're between a minus 1 and a minus 2.5, that's when you're going to plug the person into the FRAX calculator. And if their 10-year fracture risk of the hip is 3% or greater, or any major osteoporotic fracture risk is greater than 20%, mm -hmm. that patient should be on pharmacotherapy. If their FRAX score is less than that, you're going to maximize calcium, vitamin D, weight-bearing exercise, and repeat a DEXA scan in two years. All right, so how should we treat it? Well, ACOG says we should do um, really oral bisphosphonates really as the initial therapy for most postmenopausal women. You can do IV also, but for sure bisphosphonates is what should be the initial therapy. And then we talk a lot about drug holidays. And so ACOG says you can, can, um, you can discontinue bisphosphonates for the low to moderate risk patients if they're stable after five years of treatment with oral bisphosphonates or after three years of treatment with IV zoledronic acid. But longer treatment, um, up to 10 years with oral bisphosphonates or six years with IV zoledronic acid is suggested for patients at high risk of fracture. Um, denosumab, which you guys know as prolia, that can be used first line as a, so it can be used as initial therapy for any postmenopausal patient who's at increased risk of fracture who would prefer just doing this uh, every six month sub Q injection. The problem with denosumab is once you stop it, it's not like it stays incorporated in the bones and you get a prolonged effect like you do with the bisphosphonates after you discontinue them. You rapidly lose bone, I mean bone mass within a couple of months of stopping denosumab. So if you're going to stop it, you need to be transitioned to another um, anti-resorptive such as an oral bisphosphonate. And, um, Raloxifene can still be used for postmenopausal pro, um, osteoporosis prevention or treatment. It's primarily, it has a small niche. It's for those who are at increased risk for vertebral fractures because they don't have hip fracture reduction data. So this would be the younger postmenopausal woman who's primarily at increased risk of vertebral fracture and also at increased risk of breast cancer because we do know raloxifene can reduce breast cancer risk by about 50 to 55%. But they also need to be at low risk for VTE because raloxifene increases the risk of VTE, and they shouldn't have significant vasomotor symptoms because raloxifene can make it worse. With regards to the anabolic agents, like the parathyroid hormone analogs, those can be given up to two years, but really should be reserved for those at very high risk for fracture, or in those who've had significant bone loss, while they're taking the anti-resorptive, so say they're on an oral bisphosphonate, they continue to have significant bone loss or continue to fracture while on therapy, that would be someone to do like Forteo with. Also, there's a new, a really new um, medication on the market. It's called the sclerostin binding inhibitor. This is, I don't even know how you say it, Romososubab. I don't know. You can do that for one year 
of treatment in postmenopausal women at high risk of fracture who aren't at increased risk of cardiovascular disease or stroke for whom other treatments have not been effective. I doubt very much they will ever ask you about this. They might ask you, when would you consider um, having somebody, uh, when would you refer someone for the possibility of a parathyroid uh, uh, anabolic agent. All right, so how are you gonna follow them? You should get a DEXA scan every one to three years. Once you start osteoporosis pharmacotherapy, I think every two years is probably the most reasonable, but you're going to do it until the findings are stable. The optimal length of a drug holiday are really unclear. Um, so if you have a patient who's been on an oral bisphosphonate for five years, you should reevaluate the patient in two to four years after you've discontinued the bisphosphonate. And you should resume treatment if new fractures occur, if the patient gets an additional risk factor for fracture, maybe they've gone on new medications, they've had to go on steroids, et cetera, or if there's a significant decrease in their bone mineral density in their follow-up DEXA scan from compared to when they discontinued it. Again, with denosumab, you do not do a drug holiday, rapid increase in bone loss and vertebral fractures within the first few months of stopping therapy. If they're gonna stop this, you have to switch them to another anti-resorptive drug. Um, in patient, um, patients who have, if, if you're following somebody up with a, a DEXA scan, and they continue to have progressive loss of bone mineral density or new or recurrent fragility fractures while on pharmacotherapy, these are patients you're gonna to refer to the specialist, but you really need to evaluate them. Are they actually taking their medication? Are they taking it correctly? Are there some secondary causes that you missed? Or have they added in some new medications that can cause bone loss? And while the patient's on pharmacotherapy, you really should check renal function, serum calcium, and vitamin D levels every one to two years while they're on therapy. And this just goes over real quickly the guidelines. Patients should be on 1,200 milligrams of calcium per, or ingesting 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day. These are the vitamin D recommendations. We want a vitamin D level of 20 nanograms per milliliter or greater. And then, of course, weight-bearing exercise and fall-proofing the home. Um, medications that can increase bone loss, it's something to pay attention to. There are certain anti-epileptics, the antiretroviral drugs, the aromatase inhibitors that are, many of our patients are on for breast cancer, uh, cancer chemotherapy, uh, Depo-Provera, glucocorticoids, the GnRH agonists or antagonists, and heparin. And last but not least, when should you refer to an endocrinologist or an osteoporosis specialist. If somebody has a T-score less than a minus 3.0, that is severe osteoporosis. You're gonna re refer them. If they develop new fragility fractures while on treatment, if somebody has a normal bone mineral density in a fragility fracture, that's odd. And we need to have it, them these patients be evaluated by an endocrinologist or an osteoporosis specialist. Again, recurrent fracture or progressive bone loss despite treatment. And then if you find any evidence of secondary causes like hyperthyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, hypercalciuria, calciuria, or an elevated prolactin, all of those patients can be referred. And then again, if the patient has comorbidities that complicate treatment, such as chronic kidney disease, a low glomerular filtrate, filtration rate, or malabsorption syndromes. So now I'm gonna go look for some volunteers and I just need to get out of my, there we go, let me get rid of this. And then I'm to the case list and I'm going to lower everybody's hand. And then anyone who hasn't gone yet the month of October and would like to, please raise your hand. Create what I do, put everybody to sleep with my osteoporosis lecture. All right, here's somebody.
Let's see, is there anybody who hasn't gone who would like to go? Okay, then I'm going to open it up to anybody. If you've already gone, that's fine. Just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll try to get to everybody. Rit, I'm calling on you. Hi, good evening, Doctor. How are you doing? Fine, thank you. How are you? Good. You should be down at the way end. All right. Do you have a particular case or case list you'd like to go over? Uh, office uh, K16. Okay. Okay, so um, go, so this is a 24-year-old G1P0. Why don't you present her to me? Okay, so it's a 24-year-old G1P0 uh, who came because she wants uh, to become pregnant. Uh, she has history, she had history of infertility, uh, galactorrhea, high prolactin, and discontinue. Uh, she was on bromocritina before, but she discontinued two years ago. And uh, the last MRI was normal, and uh, her body max index was 32. So okay. I did the history and physical, I did some lab test, and uh, the only thing came back positive was triglycerides. And, and I did counseling, some lifestyle modification, nice folic acid supplementation, and also I um, prefer for nutritional counsel. And she was yes, she came before two visits. Okay, so let's talk about this. So she comes in desiring to get pregnant. She mm -hmm. has a history of infertility. Why? How long has she been trying to conceive? Uh, for the last past year. Okay, so when you um, talk to her, the one thing you're concerned about is this history of elevated prolactin and galactorrhea. So you're thinking, huh, I better check and make sure that's normal because that obviously can interfere with ovulation, right? Yes. Okay, so you check her prolactin and it's normal. So now how are you going to check for causes of infertility? So you've proven one thing's not broken anymore, but tell me how you're going to counsel her about different causes of infertility and how you're going to evaluate and work those up. It can be um, male factors and also female factors. Uh, it can be ovulatory problems, um, ovarian reserve, uh, can be uh, a tubal factor, uterine factor, um, and other uh, causes, and can be also. Uh, and like no identify cows. No? Okay. So anyway, by history, is she having monthly menses when she came in? Yes, yes she has. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so she... how are you going? How are you going to check to see if she's ovulating? Uh, I I I will educate, I will tell her about using um, the predictor kits, ovulation predictor kits, and also. The fact that she was having regular menses also indicates that she probably is, probably is ovulating every month. Could you do any lab tests that you could think of that would um, confirm ovulation? I can do also progesterone on, on day 21. Okay. So, all right. So it sounds like she's probably ovulating, right? Her prolactin is normal. She's having regular menses. Let's say you did a day 21 progesterone level and it's greater than three. So she's ovulating. All right. How are you going to assess for male factor infertility? Uh, okay. I will do a semen analysis. I will request a semen analysis. And uh, yeah. To okay. How, all right. How are you going to detect checked tubal factor? Uh, for tubal factor, I would do a hysterosalpingogram on day, um, usually day seven. Okay, why do we do it in that part of the menstrual cycle? 
because um, um, there is um, probably she will not be pregnant most likely uh, and also uh, it will be better visualization because there was uh, I, I think this is the things that come to my mind better visualization okay. and no, and no pregnancy. All right. Okay, and then how are you going to look for like uterine structural issues? Uh, Maybe so with the HSG, but what else could you do? I can do also a, a, a base, baseline ultrasound. No? Okay. A baseline ultrasound. Okay. And a also, a, I think I will start by that, but by, by okay. baseline. So did you do all of those tests? Uh, yeah, I did. Um, I ordered most of, most of the tests, but most of, uh, some of them they were not done. Uh, patient didn't really come back because of insurance issues. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so let's just. So what would you have done if you, her day twenty one progesterone was normal, her tubal uh, HSG revealed um, bilateral tubal patency between that and the ultrasound, there was no evidence of submucosal myomas, polyps, et cetera, and the semen analysis is normal. So now she's got unexplained infertility. How would you counsel her about that? Uh, so I will uh, I will counsel that um, everything uh, came, came back normal. And uh, one of the things that we can do as part of the management would be ovulation induction. Uh, uh, also, I could counsel about lifestyle modifications now because she was, um, her body maximum was slightly elevated, 32. So, but uh, I think I will maybe suggest ovulation uh, induction with clomiphene. So when we have un, unexplained infertility and people are actually ovulating, you could do that, but most studies have shown that it's really, if to make any impact, you need to do clomiphene plus intrauterine insemination. So it's oh. fine to say you would refer to REI for further evaluation. Do you know what I'm saying? So yeah. what I'm having a hard time figuring out here is I know you sent her to the nutritionist because of her elevated triglycerides, but that's not going to really cause infertility. I mean, yeah, they're up, but she also has a BMI of 32. You know what I mean? So she yeah. might be heading toward metabolic syndrome, I guess, with the triglycerides of 284 and her BMI of 32. You could have done an A1C level, you know what I mean, just to make sure she wasn't pre-diabetic or diabetic. But mm -hmm. I agree, you, you're you going to talk to her about losing weight. You put her on folic acid. You're going to talk to her about those, send her to the nutritionist, maybe to help with her weight and also uh, maybe not to eat as sugary and uh, of foods, which can increase triglycerides. So I guess... What was the ultimate endpoint with this patient? Mm -hmm. As I said, she didn't follow after two visits, um, okay. and she was a little concerned about if the insurance. Okay. All right. So then you can just say that she came in, you discussed with her all the different causes of infertility, how you would have to evaluate each one of those causes. It was critical that you repeated her prolactin level with this history of galactorrhea and the fact that she did discontinue the bromocryptine. You talked to her about um, the risk of obesity with, in, with um, uh, like how it affects pregnancy with increased um, loss in every trimester, et cetera. She was working on healthier lifestyle in weight loss and on folic acid and that you could just, if they said, so what are you gonna do? You could say the tests that she did were normal, but she was unable to complete the rest of the test due to insurance reasons. Okay. All and right. I think, but the, but, the, but the thing is be prepared to discuss how galactorrhea with high prolactin can cause infertility, but now it's normal. She's having normal menses and how you would walk through a basic fertility workup. Okay? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right, so let's see here. Let's get Carolyn.
Hi there. Hey, hey. Carolyn, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm so tired. <laughs> I'm just having a day. All right, so, and then I've been doing exam pro for 10 years, you guys, and I was supposed to do a Zoom at 4.30 and the candidate was so sweet, she texted me, hey, are we still on? I had her written down for next, for the 18th, not the 8th. I oh. had it all set up, so I was so flustered. And I go, oh my gosh, in 10 years of doing this, I have never screwed up not doing it. But we were, it was fine. We were able to do it an hour later. But that totally discombobulated me. So oh. anyway, I take your time all very seriously. So that was... I was flogging myself. But anyway, all right, Carolyn, when do you take your test? Um, I'm taking it December 6th. Okay, so you're, you've still got a little bit of time. And are you a generalist? Yes, I'm a generalist. Okay. All right, so you tell me what case or case list you'd like to do. Um, since we just did office, either OB or GYN, I, I feel like I have plenty of difficult cases to defend, so... <laughs> okay. Is there is there a particular one on your GYN that you would really like to do that you'd like me to question you about? Anything that just looks like it would, you know, be a difficult one to defend. Please, please feel free to okay. go after the one that's going to be rough. All right. Let me see here. Well, you know, this will be one. And of course, I think you, I can see that you'll be able to defend it probably pretty easy. But so let's let's look at this one. You have a 19-year-old G0P0 who comes in. Did she present to the emergency room in acute pain? So she did. Pre so this is a 19-year-old G0. She did present to RED in acute pain, um, but she'd actually had, it was acute in that she had had this pain acute with an acute onset, but it had started actually five days prior to her presentation to our ED. She had presented to her gynecologist um, at an Indian Health Service hospital that's more than two hours away from me um, um, in acute pain, and they she had not been able to access um, emergency surgery there, and eventually she was transferred to our facility for emergent surgery for suspected torsion. Oh, so anyway, she obviously has is uh, has extreme obesity with a BMI of 64. So based off of what did your what did the ultrasound show? Sure. So the ultrasound um, did show um, the same 10 centimeter mass. Um, the complex features, if I remember correctly, um, were a little bit of um, nodularity within the cyst, as well as um, some thinner septations. Um, so not necessarily any um, red flags for any you know, M features for malignancy. Okay. So in a go ahead. I'm sorry, she had had tumor markers with her, her outpatient gynecologist in Shiprock, and, and those had all been normal, actually, because it had just been so much time since they'd been able to, to get her to me. All right, so now, in somebody with this BMI, tell me how you entered her peritoneal cavity. Yeah, so um, I, I did do a varus entry at the umbilicus. Um, I felt that um, she hadn't had surgery um, with an umbilical entry before. She didn't have any mesh. Um, and um, she actually, I believe, had a CT as well that um, with us that didn't show um, any suspicion for, for having an issue with an umbilical entry. So I felt that that would be the area that had the thinnest um, abdominal wall and, and um, allow me the best success of... of and, and you were able to get in pretty... Okay. It was it was actually that was that was the easy part of the surgery. That was an oh. easy part. <laughs> Okay, this did not sound like it's starting good. If that was the easy part. Okay, so anyways, you get in, you insufflate the abdomen, tell me and put in the scope, tell me what you saw. Um, so I, I saw that the left ovary was torsed multiple times around the IP ligament. Um she had um a a fairly large cyst without really um, being able to see any normal ovarian tissue. Um, insufflation 
Um, she could tolerate a fair amount of Trendelenburg actually. So we had reasonable visualization, um, but I, I would suspect because of her habitus, it was mostly central obesity that we didn't have a ton of room per se. Um, so I could see mo I could see a lot of the cyst and mobilize it and detorse it, um, but it, it was you know difficult to to really um, mobilize it, manipulate the cyst further than that. Okay, so then you detorse it and you mm -hmm. attempted a cystectomy. So how did you even figure out in this mass where you could not even see really any normal tissue? where to even start and what yeah. to do so um thankfully i had um i was it was the end of my call shift and i had um i i was able to start this case at the beginning of my colleagues call shift so i we were able to do this with two docs thankfully and i i um because most of the time i operate with a um with my scrub tech um so um, it was really helpful to have her assistance for sure and getting good exposure. Uh, to together looking at it, we found an area that looked pretty thin. Um, it looked like it was um, 180 from the IP. It looked like it was kind of 180 from where we would presume the um, the mesenteric, I'm, it's not anti-mesenteric, that's not the right word for it. Um, <laughs> 180 from kind of the blood supply um, mm -hmm. would be, and so that was kind of our best guess as a as a way to enter. And we were initially able to develop a plane there, actually, um, and we hydro dissected that for a while. the The issue came up that as we hydro dissected and continued to try and bluntly peel this out, it did rupture one, and then two. Um, you know, as we were peeling it out, it's it, we actually entered the IP basically. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because there just because there was no tissue. So then, did you get into a a lot of bleeding? Um. So the bleeding was not so brisk that I felt I had to open her, but with the amount of brisk bleeding, my concern was that if I didn't take the entire ovary at the IP that I would have to open her and that I wouldn't have any chance of actually salvaging the ovary in the first place. In this patient and knowing her social history as well, um, she was really concerned about having to recover from a laparotomy. She cared for multiple people in her home. Uh, she was a caregiver for multiple people in her home um, as well. And so the recovery from the surgery was a major concern for her. Um, and so I, I felt in those circumstances that my best option was to, to take the ovary at the IP. Okay. Um, then, so now how did you make sure in all of that bleeding, et cetera, that you maybe didn't clamp the ureter in when you're clamping that IP ligament? So I, I would say we were really lucky in that the IP was long enough that I could really take it multiple centimeters away from the pelvic sidewall. Um, you know, that the, the, I could kind of come under the IP and really snug it up right against basically what appeared to be the cyst. Um, okay, gotcha. Actually have to enter the pelvic. I wasn't actually near the pelvic sidewall. Okay. All right. So now um, it, th it did show a cystadenofibroma, diffused marked hemorrhage and necrosis of the ovary. Did the tissue look necrotic? Yes. I mean, like, okay. So if, if it had just been blackish blue and you were able to do a cystectomy, you were able to t remove remove successfully remove the cyst you look at the tube in the ovary and it's still kind of a darkish purple but mm -hmm. everything's structurally intact and it's not like falling apart or bleeding can you leave that i would leave it yes and okay definitely yeah leave it. and when do you have to remove it um if there's inadequate hemostasis um I mean, even 
if it appe appeared infected, mm -hmm. um, you know, if I thought it was a TOA and, yes. um, you know, it, I didn't think it was going to heal from that standpoint, but really in this type of patient, I would really want to save the ovary and leave it. Um, so even if I, even if to my eye, it appeared still dusky, I, I would leave it with the hope that it would revascularize. Right. So what would a necrotic adnexa look like? What would, what would make you go, oh my gosh, I cannot save this? Um, huh. So seriously, it'd be sh like shredding. Like you just go to touch it, it's like falling apart. It's okay. a dematis, it's bleeding. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like not, so it's not structurally like intact. So as long as everything's structurally intact and it's not bleeding, mm -hmm. then who cares what color it is? Because yep. we don't use color alone as an indicator of tissue viability. But if With it's interpretive tissue. Yeah, exactly. All right, perfect. All right, good. I think that was an excellent, uh, excellent management in the poor thing. And, you know, it didn't feel like it at the time. She, you, she was doing great and perfectly happy, but it didn't feel like it at the time. <laughs> no, I'm sure. You know, never want to remove the ad, an, ad next of a 19 year old, but you know, had you had the, had you seen her five days prior, which none of that's your fault, but it had been, you know, going on obviously for a while. All right. So what would you have done if that final pathology came back? Serous cystadeno, serous cystadenoma of low malignant potential. Um, so that is, um, in that case, if she had um, negative pelvic washings, which she did, um, then this patient can still keep her other ovary as long as she desires future fertility. Um, and she would need surveillance um, with serial ultrasounds in the future. So here, here don't forget to say you're going to consult GYN on. Because yes. remember, we don't have to be the experts on everything. I'm a generalist also. So you could say, if I got back a pathology report of that, um, the first thing I do would, would be to consult my GYN oncologist. But I think what they would recommend is, and then you could go through what your recommendations are. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Good. Any questions for me, Carolyn? No. No, that was really helpful. Thank you so much. Uh huh. Thank you. All right, we'll get Dr. Agu. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, yeah, you're first. Hear. You're first on the list. <laughs> And this is my first time, a lot of firsts, so. <laughs> oh, a lot of firsts. Okay, well, thank you for being brave enough to volunteer. You are among friends, so there you go. Okay. Are you a generalist? No, I'm actually a Eurogyne fellow. Oh, Eurogyne, okay. So you don't get to do, you get to do the OB case list. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> All right, let me okay. just take a quick peek through here and let's just see. I'm going to actually kind of go toward the end and then. Okay. All right, this, let's do this one. This would be good for you. This, okay. this will be good for you. <laughs> right, as my heart's racing. If you feel my, if you feel my heart yes, racing. Okay. Don't, don't let your heart race. I'm okay, <laughs> so let's talk about, so first of all, um, I, I'm looking at patient number 20, who's 18 year old G1P0. First thing I noticed that she has fetal growth restriction that was diagnosed at 34 weeks. How do you make the diagnosis of fetal growth restriction? So um, fetal growth restriction um, is the diagnosis of an estimated fetal weight of less than the 10th percentile. Um, and I also believe 
um, abdominal circumference less than the 10th percentile as well. Okay. All right. So let's say you did an ultrasound at the 34 weeks. The estimated fetal weight was 7th percentile. So mm -hmm. now how are you going to figure out if this is truly a growth restricted infant or just a constitutionally small infant? Um, that's a good question. Um, I believe I would look at her other measurements to see if there's like symmetric or asymmetric um, um, growth. Um, that's where I would start. And I would also kind of just look at the pattern of her prior growth um, sonos to see if this is a continuous pattern or if this is a change. What, uh, in addition to doing growth ultrasounds, so she's at 34 weeks, tell me from that point on, how are you going to follow her? What type of antenatal testing are you going to do to assess the well being of the fetus? Sure. Um, in addition to um, growth sonos, I would want to do antenatal screening, including um, biophysical profiles, as well as um, looking at her uh, fetal umbilical artery dopplers just to make sure that there's no increased morbidity associated with the fetal growth restriction. So tell, talk to me about the Dopplers. We're going to usually, MFM will usually do those one, once a week. How do the, tell me about the findings of the Doppler and how it helps us with our management of when we're reassured and when we would be worried and want to get the baby delivered sooner. Um, so I believe if um, the Doppler is, for instance, the, um, you're looking for the, the diastolic flow. So um, whether you have normal Doppler flow or um, re absent or reverse Doppler flow um, with reverse um, signifying increased morbidity um, and, at, and, the, and the fetus being at risk for mortality and then and that will prompt you to move towards um, either increased um, surveillance or delivery. Um, that would be my answer. <laughs> okay, so now let's talk about um, if you have somebody with just fetal growth restriction, the amniotic fluids normal, antenatal testings normal, Dopplers, um, umbilical artery Dopplers are normal, typically when would you want to deliver that an uncomplicated IUGR? Typically, I believe an uncomplicated IUGR you would deliver at 39 weeks. And if there's any concern, um, then you would deliver sooner at around 37 weeks. All right. So now let's talk about um, what are different risk factors for fetal growth restriction? So um, when I'm considering the risk factors for fetal growth restriction, um, I can divide it into maternal and fetal, I guess, and also placental. Um, so maternal causes could just be this nutritional status. So her uh, mom having a, um, a long-standing um, malnutrition or she's just not um, consuming a, a, a diet that will promote appropriate fetal growth during the pregnancy. Um, mom having co um, comorbidities, including like hypertensive disorder or diabetes, um, pre-existing pre-gestational diabetes. Um, or if mom has like an autoimmune disorder, anything that will cause or some sort of med predisposition, predisposing medical condition. In terms of the fetus, um, if things, a lot of things can increase the risk of fetal growth restriction, including like um, if you have a multiple gestation, if there's any fetal anomalies. Um, again, in the setting of mom having um, comorbidities, including preeclampsia or sorry, hypertension or uh, diabetes. Um, if there is like a perinatal infection, those are some things that I would that I would say for now. Okay, so now um, let's switch gears and talk about her cholestasis. How did you diagnose that? So we um, diagnosed cholestasis um, with symptoms in addition to her bile acids. So um, this mom um, complained of um, itching that was focused on her hands. The, the, her hands, the palm of her hands and, and her feet, the sole of her feet and worsened at nighttime. Um, also, um, we did order bile acids and they were elevated. Our institution uses the cutoff of 10. And so it's greater than 10. And so um, given their, her clinical symptom, symptoms and the bile acid findings, and in addition to consultation with um, MFM, the disposition was made for um, delivery. 
Okay, and why, so with regards to cholestasis of pregnancy, we know the mom feels miserable, itching, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I see that you put her on your so, your so dial. Um, but tell me, why do we want to deliver the baby early? Um, there is an increase of, um, of fetal demise uh, with uh, cholestasis of pregnancy. And so you want to deliver the baby early to prevent that. Is cholestasis of pregnancy likely to recur in a subsequent pregnancy? That's a good question. I believe if the mom has had it, she is at higher risk, but I'm honestly not quite sure. I would have to look that up just to confirm. She is up to 90% likelihood it can recur. Okay. Isn't that weird? So do yeah. we have any idea why um, the cholestasis causes increased risk of IUFD? Um, I would assume it has something to do with the bile acids, but I'm not sure. Okay, it, it does. It, it, we, we know the bile acids cross the placenta. We know mm -hmm. they concentrate in the fetus, but as for how it actually causes that IUFD, we don't know. Hypothetically, okay. we think it could possibly concentrate in like the electrical conduction system of the heart and it might be okay. the lethal fetal arrhythmia, but that's a guess. The okay. bottom line is the bile acids cross the placenta and concentrate in the fetus. And okay. so if, if what would you do if the um, bile acids were greater than 100? At that point, I would I would uh, move towards delivery given the high risk of um, mortality um, yeah, with the bile acid greater than 100. This is the MFM, the Society for MFM says if it's greater than 100, they look at delivery around 36 weeks. So you would, they would actually consider doing a, a preterm delivery. And if that was the case, what would you maybe give the baby prior to induction? Sure. So if I'm delivering at 36 weeks, um, I would, um, of course, notify my team just so the um, MFM and as well as the pediatrics are the pediatricians are aware, but I would give the baby um, antenatal corticosteroids um, okay. as well as if I'm inducing penicillin. Okay. Um, throughout the labor course. Perfect. So see, you did just fine. You did a nice oh, job. Yeah. You talked about <laughs> growth restriction. You covered all the topics. You covered cholestasis of pregnancy. You did great. So. Take a deep breath and you can slow your heart rate down now. Woo, thank you. <laughs> okay, sometimes it's the first step is the hardest, but then really Seriously, once you start life. having it, you just realize, okay, really, I'm just having a dialogue explaining what I do and why. So good job. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Let's get Jennifer in here. Hey, Jennifer. Hi. Can you How hear me? are you? Yep, I can. Are you? You're a generalist? I am, yeah. Okay, so you, dealer's choice. We've done all three case lists. You tell me what you'd like to do. Um, either GYN or office would be fine. All right. Mm, let's do GYN. Do you have anything really interesting? <laughs> I have a couple, but I'm game for anything, really. All right. Let's look at patient 20. Okay. So she's 57, intermittent pelvic pain, persistent left ovarian cyst in the seat. So she's postmenopausal, right? 
Yes, correct. Okay. So CT abdomen and pelvis shows this 3.4 centimeter. Was it a simple cyst? It, they didn't actually characterize it beyond that on the CT when that was done um, during her ER visit. Okay. Um, and then the follow-up pelvic ultrasound a couple months later um, showed persons, persistence of this left ovarian cyst complex in nature. Okay, so tell me, so you did tumor markers. So tell me the pain. Was it really in the left lower quadrant? It was, um, and it would come and go. It wasn't persistent but it was aggravating enough for the patient um, that after discussing risks and benefits, um, the patient and I decided that we would move forward with removal of the cyst. Okay, what are some other causes of left lower quadrant pain, especially in an uh, older woman like a 57-year-old? Right, so um, we can think about it in um, GYN etiologies and the non -e non-GYN etiologies. So um, for GYN etiologies, um, we think about ovarian cysts, especially um, with torsion, potentially a large fibroid um, that's causing kind of mass effect bulk symptoms. Um, Non-GYN, um, like GI specifically, we would worry about diverticulitis or diverticulosis. Um, any sort of, um, you know, kidney issues for GU, um, interstitial cystitis, um, bladder pain syndrome, um, et cetera. Um, and then it can also be um, something like uh, pelvic floor pain, um, dyspareunia, um, as well as kind of a psychiatric in nature. Okay. All right. So anyway, but with um, her intermittent pain, when you did her pelvic exam, could you kind of reproduce mm -hmm. that tenderness when with palpating her left adnexa? I could actually, yes. Okay, all right. So then the decision was made. So her tumor markers were negative. So now the ultrasound shows a complex cyst. Tell me what findings on ultrasound would be suspicious for malignancy, and when would you refer someone like this to GYN oncology? Sure. So um, findings on ultrasound that would be worrisome for malignancy include um, a cyst size larger than 10 centimeters, um, thick septations um, greater than 2 millimeters, papillary excrescences, um, presence of ascites, um, increased Doppler flow to the ovary, um, solid components, um, to name a few. Okay. All right. And so um, what tumor markers did you actually do on her? So for her, I did a CA-125, a CEA, and a CA-199. Okay. All right. So then tell me why the decision was to leave her right ovary. Why not just do a BSO on a 57-year-old postmenopausal woman? Sure. So in someone who's 57 and upon um, going in for my laparoscopy, uh, her right ovary looked completely normal. Um, and so the discussion that we had previously um, at our pre-op was that um, given that her age is 57, um, as long as her remaining ovary looks normal, that we would leave it in place. Um, ACOG recommends, um, you know, uh, leaving the ovaries um, in place up until age 65 because there is some still protection um, for the heart and for bone. All right. Is there, are you aware of any newer data that has come out recently that says maybe the benefit dissipates at a younger age? I, I yeah so there there is discussion that um you can consider it early or as even early as 55 yeah yeah so well. anyway so it's all about shared decision making right so you tell right. the patient look we have data that says that uh, up until age 65 the ovary may continue to give additional benefit with reduction of cardiovascular disease cognitive impairment um uh, bone protection and all cause mortality. That benefit decreases the closer and closer you get to age 65. Um, with regards to 
removing it, the biggest reason to remove it would be what? The risk of getting another cyst or the risk okay. of ovarian cancer, right? What is, if, if for the average risk woman, what what is their lifetime risk? What's our lifetime risk of developing ovarian cancer? Um, is it somewhere along the lines of like one to two percent? Okay, all right, and then um, let's see, what was I gonna say? So then tell me how you counsel her about how you reduce her risk of ovarian cancer by doing the uh, bilateral salpingectomy. Right, so um, during kind of um, our discussion of uh, the surgery um, procedure, we had discussed removing both fallopian tubes um, given um, the evidence that there has been, you know, shown to be ovarian cancer that originates in the fimbriae of the fallopian tubes. Um, and so we did a, you know, a risk reducing prophylactic salpingectomy on the right side as well. Okay. And so then with regards to her, what did you actually see when you went in there? Right. So on the right side looked completely normal. And then on the left side, it actually looked like um, the ovarian cyst had collapsed. Um, and so it looked overall normal. Um, and we actually did collect pelvic washings, which were also negative as well. How, when did this, how far back did this pain start? She had it for several months actually. And then by the time that I saw her pre opter and got her into surgery, it was probably only lapsed like a month or two. Okay. And so, so it, is she pain free now? She is. She was actually very happy when I saw her for pre op and um, hadn't had any further pain afterwards besides the, the immediate post surgical Excellent. pain. Yeah, so the whole big thing with the left lower quadrant pain, you always wonder, especially in somebody's postmenopausal, is that little cyst there just a red herring? Meaning, is mm -hmm. it something else causing her left lower quadrant pain, like, you know, diverticulitis, diverticulosis? Does she have IBS? Does she have chronic constipation? You know, especially right. in that left lower quadrant where that rectosigmoid colon comes down. So that probably would be the main thing I would pick out of this and then how you could counsel how, how she described the pain, how when you did mm -hmm. the exam, you could reproduce the pain. Um, you gave time for this cyst to resolve. It didn't, if anything, I mean, I know there's a difference of the CT and the ultrasound, but it certainly didn't get smaller. You know what I mean? Right. Um, it, right. it, it perhaps got bigger and it was complex and she was postmenopausal and she was having symptoms. And despite the tumor markers being negative, you did shared decision-making. That's what you did and her pain is gone. So yay, yay for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, have, I have no other questions with regards okay. to that. All right, Thank any questions for me? Yeah. No, that was good. That was helpful. Yeah, and you, you did a good job of like when you would refer to GYN oncology. And of course, obviously, if it had some of the signs and symptoms suspicious for malignancy, or if you had elevation in the tumor markers, any of those, of course, would you would refer to GYN onc. All right. Sorry. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks. All right, let's get one more in real quick. Let's get Lauren. So you're still muted on your end, Lauren. Hello. Hey, there you are. How you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Generalist or subspecialist? Um, I'm an oncology fellow. Okay. So, oh boy, you get to do OB too. Oh, great. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> we are not going to let you do like a GYN one. So you know that. And all your office ones are going to all be about cancer. So we have to do something different. Um, all right, let's just do this one. Um, patient number two, you have a 36-year-old G3P0 at 28 and 4 who comes in to triage or wherever complaining she had a gush of fluid. How are you going to actually confirm PPROM? So um, 
first I would um, put the patient on the monitor. I would assess the fetal status and the maternal status. I would then uh, do, a phys do a history. Um, I would attempt to assess how much fluid came out, the consistency of the fluid, whether it was bloody, whether it was meconium stained. Um, I would then also do a sterile speculum examination um, to assess for um, pooling, bleeding. Um, I would collect a um, sample of whatever's pooling in the vagina and I would do a fern and I would test um, the nitrazine. All right, so the nitrazine, amniotic fluid is basic, so it's going to turn the nitrazine blue. But what else can give you a false positive nitrazine? If there's blood or semen um, in the uh, mixed in the amniotic fluid, it could possibly alter the results. Okay, anything else you can think of? Um, I, nothing's coming to mind right this minute. Okay, Lauren, it would be like um, BV or trichomonas, you know, those okay. are the two vaginitis yeah. that, it, yeah. Um, yeah. And then sometimes even the KY jelly, but anyway, the other big ones would be the, those two vaginitis causes of vaginitis. Okay, so anyway, so now you confirm P-prom at 28 and four. What are you gonna do? Um, at this point, I would um, do an ultrasound to assess uh, and to assess for placental location um, for fetal presentation. Um, and then I would do a digital examination at this point to determine, you know, how far dilated the patient is and assess whether or not she's contracting to see if um, the to use all of those factors to determine how we can best move forward. All right, so I totally agree with doing the ultrasound to see the um, presentation. And of course, she's a transverse lie, which makes you concerned about what what can come out That's through that. Cervix. cord prolapse. Correct. I would not do a digital exam with PPROM. I would just look with the speculum because we want to minimize introducing infection, et cetera. Up, um, Even if you, this patient specifically was like, I think I remember contracting a lot. So she was in a lot of pain. So okay, well, that, if, if she's contracting, fine, but you didn't write that. You just said okay. PPROM. Do you see what okay. I'm saying? So I didn't see PPROM in preterm labor. Then yes, okay. you are going to check her 100%. Right. But if it really was just PPROM, you're going to not do an exam. Does that make okay. sense? You're just going to put her on yeah. her latency antibiotics and get the steroids on board, et cetera. But okay. PPROM and contracting, that's a different story. I agree. You're going to do what, what you just described. Does that make sense what I said? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I just, I'm trying to remember exactly. This was obviously a long time ago. So I'm just trying to remember exactly what the circumstances were in this situation. Yeah, gotcha. So let's just, let's pretend it, she really did just come in with PPROM. You confirmed PPROM, you put her on latency antibiotics, got her steroids on board, put her on mag sulfate, but at some point in time, she developed tachycardia, uh, um, maternal fever, tachycardia was it maternal tachycardia or fetal tachycardia do you remember both. it was both it was both okay so maternal fetal fever and fetal and maternal tachycardia so you made the diagnosis of intraamniotic infection based off of that correct yes so tell me what you give her for latency antibiotics and then what you switched her to when you made the diagnosis of intraamniotic infection. So for latency antibiotics, I would give azithromycin times one dose, I think one gram. And then I would give um, ampicillin um, starting with IV. Um, I'm trying to remember the dose, I want to say, um, 
You know what, seriously, you could even just say for 20, um, for 48 would, hours. And then okay, I would give her IV and switching to yep. switching to PO. Okay, so then, um, then once she developed choreo, now we want to get her delivered. So if she hadn't been contracting on her own, you would have done what? I would have done tocolysis. Okay. You mean if you, what? Wait, so I'm sorry, okay. I think I misunderstood the question. Okay, so if she developed intraamniotic infection, oh, I would do a C-section, or I would um, induce, depending on the fetal presentation. One hundred percent. That's exactly right. Now, in this case, you're be, with the transverse lie that hasn't changed. You're going to have to do a C-section. Tell me why you did a classical C-section. Um, the lower uterine segment was not well developed. Um, the fetus was small, and in order to facilitate uh, extraction of a transverse lie um, in a preterm fetus, I, I think a classical cesarean is the safest option in that situation. Tell me then how you're going to counsel her about how she's going to need to deliver in subsequent pregnancies. Um, I would counsel the patient that with a classical cesarean section, we do not recommend that the patient labor um, and that she would need to be delivered by scheduled cesarean delivery in um, subsequent pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Do you know about what gestational age you would do that? I would say between 37 and 38 weeks. Okay. All right. What would you have done if this the presentation was breach and then she developed an intraamniotic infection started rapidly contraction contracting the baby is delivering the buttocks are at the perineum and you have an entrapped head okay. tell me how you're going to manage this um i would call everyone available for assistance um to see if there are more senior providers available to um assist with this with this breach delivery um because i think with the you know the body already out i probably you know you have to make a decision as to what's going to be the least morbid for the patient and for the um for the patient and for the fetus um initially i think i would attempt to um to place super pubic pressure um and adjust the maternal positioning in order to help facilitate this delivery possibly put the the mother on hands and knees positioning um if possible uh to see if that can sort of relieve the head entrapment um then um i know that there are certain maneuvers i would place my hand into the vagina, see if I could um, attempt to um, flex the fetal head to see if that would release the entra entrapment. Um, further down the line, there are also incisions that you can make onto the cervix that um, would possibly help to release the entrapped head and the utility of Piper forceps. I um, have not utilized these, but um, I know that they are available and an option. Okay, and tell me where you would make those incisions on the cervix. I would make it at six o'clock, two o'clock, and eight, uh, six o'clock, two o'clock, and 10 o'clock. Perfect, that's exactly right. The other thing you can do is, um, there we're supposed to keep like sublingual nitroglycerin on labor and delivery now. You can put that underneath the, um, you know, to give, I think it's like two squirts underneath the maternal tongue. And then <clears throat> that can actually cause relaxation of the cervix. So can um, maybe terbutaline might, um, I know sometimes some of the halogenated anesthetics can, but uh, if you need to get that baby out and it, that head is stuck doing Dursons at two, 10 and six will help to just open up that cervix so you can get the baby out. 
So um, good job on that. Can you go over the names of those maneuvers? I know one is like um, a very multiple of, people. You're about that. You're Marce, Marceau Marcelli Vite. Oh my, I'm never going to remember that. So I guess yeah, don't I, remember it. You could just say what basically if the head was entrapped, you would just do super pubic pressure to just see if that could help flex the head. You would um, possibly just try to put your fingers up, see if you could uh, feel where the maxilla is, see if by flexing that, if that helped. If that didn't help, you want some sort of a um, Rela a uterine relaxant to see if you can relax the cervix. And if that doesn't work, you're doing Dersons and that's all oh. you need to worry about. Okay. Okay, excellent. All right, so good. Um, I think that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Lauren. All right, you guys, so we've went, gone about 10 minutes past, um, but anyway, I will be back with you on Sunday. I'm going to lower everybody's hand, see if there's any last minute questions or comments. Looks like we're good. All right, thanks for um, participating.